Hey, I assume you're here from the first video, and if you're not here from the first video, then that's weird. Go watch that one first. Go look in the related videos for the thing you see on the screen. That should help you find it. Now that you've got some basics under you, including a pretty basic vocabulary list, there are two cornerstones of the Japanese language you absolutely must learn and master in order to get good at it. The concepts are particles and conjugation. Most learning sources will dance around teaching you these two concepts early on, mainly focusing on vocabulary, but I think getting hands-on with these two concepts early on will actually help you in the long run. The problem with learning only vocabulary words is you don't have an efficient way to study them or get some use out of them. If we learn them right here in the very beginning, then you can use the new words you learn, and this is also a good indicator of whether or not you're into Japanese. Today we're going to focus on particles, and we'll do conjugation next time. Particles are essentially sounds used to indicate the relevance of a word to the rest of a thought or sentence. This sounds a little complicated when you first hear it, because we don't have something like this in English, but it's surprisingly simple when you get into it. There's at least a dozen of these little buggers, but today we're going to learn how to use four of them. The first one we'll look at is wa. Wa is often referred to as the topic marker, and it means that everything you are about to say refers back to this. This is the very first particle that everybody learns when they get into Japanese. It's important because this is how you mark what it is you want to talk about. Some of you might still be confused about this whole particle thing, so let's put it into practice. Last time we learned that the Japanese word for dog is inu. If we want to say something to somebody else that particularly relates to dogs, then our sentence should begin inu wa. This lets the listener know that everything we're about to say refers to dogs. Because of the way the language works, this can also mean that we're referring to a specific dog. If you and I are both at a park and we see a dog, and I say inu wa, then the other person is going to assume that I'm talking about that dog in particular. Next on the list is ga. For the most part, ga is used to establish nouns to a premise that we've already set up. So if the talker and the listener both already know what they're talking about, then most nouns will be marked with ga instead of switching to a completely new topic with wa. Sometimes you'll get a little confused about when to use wa and when to use ga, but actually it's not quite as important as you might think it is. You should still try to get the right one, and you should still not mess up and use the wrong one as often as possible, but if you do mess up in the beginning, trust me, it'll come with time. Let's go back to our sentence before. This sentence here means that we want to say something specific about dogs, or we want dogs to be the main topic of our conversation. But let's change it. Now the sentence is going to be watashi wa, and hopefully you remember that watashi refers to ourselves. Inu ga. This sentence here is essentially saying, so about me, dogs are something. I could be saying that I like or dislike dogs, I could be saying whether or not I have a dog, I could even be talking about whether or not I hear or see a dog. In the last part we'll get some verbs to play around with, but for right now particles are the main concern. The conversation is about me, but I'm trying to say something about dogs, and probably how dogs relate to me in some way. Our third particle, wo, is very specific. It marks a noun that is being directly impacted by a verb. Most sentences will end with a verb, and the wo represents that this is the item that is being affected by the verb. You may notice that I wrote this out a little weird, and it's because there are some particles that are written and said two different ways. I know somebody in the comments has probably already typed something out about the way I use wa. I have these things typed out the way that they should be pronounced out loud, but when you're actually learning to write them, you'll be using different symbols. The particle o is often said as o without the w, but when you're writing it out, it has a special character, representing w-o. The symbol for wa, by the way, is the hiragana ha. You don't need to know that right now, but it is fun food for thought, and I am curious to see if anybody would actually put that in the comments without watching the entire video first. Another word you would have learned in the other video is mizu. Mizu is talking about water, and it's all kinds of water. The kind you drink, the kind that's in lakes, the kind that comes out of your faucet. Because it's so versatile, it's great for learning o, because any number of things could be happening to it. We could be drinking it, pouring it, splashing it, all sorts of things. Let's bring back the good old watashi wa for this. Then let's add mizu o. 
Notice again how we didn't pronounce the W even though the W is technically there. Watashi wa mizu o. This sentence most likely means that I interact with water using whatever verb we have for the sentence. Again, I could be drinking the water, I could be buying the water, I could be pouring the water, I could be shaking the water. Whatever I'm doing, it's directly affecting the water. Again, I want to point out that because of the way context works in Japanese, we could be talking about water that the listener and I are both aware of, like water that's right in front of us, or I could be talking about water as a concept. The last particle we'll learn today is de. De is considered a little advanced because it can have two main meanings. The first use of de is to mark a location that the verb is taking place in. For example, if you were buying something from the store, then you would mark the store with de. This lets the user know that this is where it's happening or has happened. The second use is to mark an object that we personally use for the verb. Some examples of this would be a spoon or a fork that we eat with, a car or a bus that we take trips on, or a shovel or rake that we do yard work with. The object we're performing with is the de. A good way to learn these together is to connect them somehow so that you realize that it's the same particle that you're using for both. The through line that I like to use is necessary in performing the verb. So whether you're eating with a spoon or at a restaurant, you still use de. One word we learned last week was uchi. Uchi can be a house, an apartment, or even a cardboard box. By the way, if you live in a cardboard box and you manage to get to this video, I'm actually impressed. Good job. Being the smart little cookies you are, you've probably figured out by now that if we mark this with de, it means that our house is where whatever verb we're talking about is happening or has happened. It could be eating, it could be sleeping, it could be watching TV. We haven't really learned any tools yet, but we will. I know some of you might have been intimidated by the idea of particles when we first started all of this, but I hope now you see that it's not quite as scary as textbooks make it sound sometimes. And I've got some news for you. If you understood what was in this video, then congratulations. And I sincerely mean it. If you got through this episode and you understood what I was talking about with the particles, then you've crossed one of the two major hurdles into getting into the language. Learning the other particles is just as easy as learning what they are and learning how to apply them. You take that, and you combine it with conjugating verbs, and you've got yourself a new language. To help you practice these particles, I've got a new list of words for you. Otoko means male. It doesn't really mean man by itself, it's specifically referring to something as being male. Onna is the female equivalent. I want to make clear early on, I know we learned kare and kanojo last week, but these are completely different. Kare and kanojo mean that you are referring to somebody who is not currently in the conversation, but you are also marking their gender to make them easier to identify. Onna and otoko are identifiers to differentiate between whether or not somebody is or isn't male or female. It's also used for animals. Niku means meat particularly any meat that you buy or cook. Just like in English, fish is identified differently than meat is. So if what you want is specifically fish, then you use sakana. Also just like in English, this refers to both the fish that you can eat and also the living fish that swim around. Mise is store. It's talking about a store in general. There are specific words for department stores or grocery stores. Until you learn what those specific words are, mise should be fine for everything. The restaurant is an example of Japan borrowing a word from English. As you may have guessed, the restaurant will be written in katakana, and yes, this is the serious word that they use for eateries. Koen refers to parks. Ohashi is the Japanese word for chopsticks. Ongaku is music. Ongaku refers to music as a whole, so you can't use it in substitute for a word like song. It's just talking about music in general. The last word on your list is sake. Sake is kind of a weird one in Japanese. You might be used to sake just being a type of alcohol, so it might feel like I'm teaching you a word like sushi or kamikaze or something that already comes from Japan, but hear me out. In Japan, sake is used as a general term for all alcoholic drinks. So if you're gonna go out to a club and drink tequila and beer and that kind of stuff, you are generally going out to drink sake, even if you don't drink Japanese sake. 
Unless you say that you're going to drink something specific, you use sake when you say you're going to drink alcohol, or whether or not you do drink alcohol. Now, I know we're running really long here, but there is one more tool that I want to give you to help your Japanese study go a little bit smoother. This word is a bit of a meme by now, but it's a very important word to learn. I'm gonna teach you about des. Now, first things first, despite the U at the end, and despite the way some people pronounce it to uh, sound a bit more weebish, it is pronounced des. The reason for this is because there are two different characters in hiragana that represent the sound su. One of them is tsu, and the other one is just su. To speak more fluidly and to keep the two separate from each other, when you just see an s and a u, it's normally just pronounced s instead of su, and tsu is pronounced tsu. We'll talk about it more in another episode, just for now, keep in mind that this word is correctly pronounced as des, regardless of whether or not it has a u in the end. Des is an ending word representing is, am, and are. What a lot of teachers and textbooks won't teach you is that des also acts as a verb filler. If you don't have a specific verb ready for a sentence and you just want to point out that something is also something else, then you put des at the end. Believe it or not, even though this is pretty simple, this is actually huge for you because knowing this means that you now have something to put at the end of your sentences to practice more efficiently. Kare wa inu desu. Watashi wa onna desu. If you've been paying attention so far and you understand the two sentences I just made, then you've already gotten to a point in Japanese where you can make full sentences clarifying one thing as another thing. I taught you the words for fruits, vegetables, and meats, and if you're willing to learn what specific names of fruits and vegetables and meats are, then you can now clarify those as being fruits, vegetables, and meats. Even if you didn't want to learn more vocabulary, you can specify what the names of certain buildings are. Target to wa mise des. If somebody didn't know what a target was, you can now clarify that target is the name of a store. The only thing you're really missing right now is the ability to use and conjugate verbs. Next time. Thank you so much for watching the second part. I know that Japanese can seem a little bit daunting at first, but I hope I'm helping you see a little bit that it can be a lot easier if you break it down using logic. By the end of next episode, you should know whether or not Japanese is right for you. Spoiler alert, I think it is.